All right. Let's, uh, let's see. We've got a bunch of Super Chat questions, but I want to cover the second uh, topic. First, let me just see if there's anything relevant. Um, uh, okay. Um, let us, let's do America 2.0. Right. Um, okay. So, what happens after this crisis is over is the question. What does America look like once coronavirus is gone? And and to put this in context, we've had two dramatic events over the last. 20 years that can give us a hint with regard to what the world looks like post-dramatic event. And the two dramatic events I'm thinking of are 9-11 in 2001 and the 2008 financial crisis. Two dramatic events that arguably changed America, changed our laws, changed our behavior, changed our attitudes, changed our perspective. And in both cases, we are still living their outcome. We're still living the consequences. And arguably, in both cases, we misidentified the problem, misdiagnosed the issue, came to the wrong conclusions, changed our behavior in wrong destructive ways that have changed America, I think, generally for the worst. And the question is, will the same thing happen to us as a consequence of the coronavirus and the lockdown? And, and this, is, this is motivated by, uh, you know, a, um, a question I got from David Strasburg. And he, he sent a list of questions, and I'm going to go through those questions. But first, I want to remind you of kind of what happened post 9-11, what happened post 2008, to give you a sense of how this works. So obviously post 9-11, we made Islamic, well, we didn't make Islam, we made terrorism the biggest threat to American security there is. At the expense of really all other threats, and one could argue that, to some extent, our lack of preparedness for a pandemic is partially caused by the fact that our foreign policy is single-mindedly focused on terrorism, on Islamic terrorism. Now, it, it's a little scary because, you know, imagine if the terrorists had used biological weapons, we are pathetically ill-equipped and unready to deal with it as this coronavirus is illustrated. So let's hope they don't learn the lesson, or let's hope we can we learn how to deal with it in the future. But 9-11, we misidentified the problem. The problem was terrorism. We refused to name the enemy, Islamic totalitarianism. We launched into meaningless wars where thousands of American young men died, and well over a trillion dollars, or maybe much more than a trillion dollars, were completely and utterly squandered. We, for a while, squashed the terrorism against us, but didn't destroy the terrorists or their infrastructure. And there was a long period of time where the terrorism struck a little bit in the United States, but a lot in Europe. That, too, seems to have been squashed. By the way, as I predicted, I said over and over again, that the problem of terrorism in Europe is the existence and the thriving of ISIS. And that when you, once you got rid of ISIS, the terrorism would go away. And everybody, I remember all the people on the chat and all the people in, uh, in Facebook saying, oh, what are you talking about? You know, the problem is the Muslims in Europe and the Muslims in Europe will always commit terrorism. ISIS has nothing to do with it. You can't defeat the Muslims Europe by defeating ISIS, but we have, right? By defeating ISIS, you've, you know, nobody, as I said at the time, nobody actually wants to die and commit a suicide 
bombing a suicide mission on behalf of a losing ideology. And if you show them it's a losing ideology, terrorism plummets, and it has. But I don't expect anybody to pat me on the back and say, Yuan, you were right again, we were all wrong. Particularly not the people at the time who claimed to be wrong. But they were wrong. I was right. Again. Um, 9-11 also brought with this not only, no, not only, the, um, the wrong wars, the misidentification of the problem, the misidentification of the enemy, but it's all brought us, as a consequence of all that, a massive surveillance state. It brought us the NSA. It brought us everything that Snowden revealed, and nothing has changed since then. It brought us secret courts to America, secret FBI warrants, secret listening in and collecting data, and, and you know specific data, mass data, all kinds of data. that the NSA and other intelligence audience, uh, elements are getting against us. And we all don't care. It also bought us the TSA. Think about, I mean, those of you vaguely remember, think about pre and post 9-11, what it was like going to the airport. You remember going to the gate with your guests? You remember meeting people at the gate? I mean... The post, pre-post 9-11 security, the pre-post 9-11 TSA, it brought us a massive government bureaucracy that is dedicated to harassing us at the airport in the name of security and safety. And nobody remembers what it was like before, and nobody seems to care anymore about TSA. TSA is like a metaphysical reality. It's unchallenged. Nobody cares. Nobody cares one iota about them. You remember George Bush created the largest restructuring of government and the, the growth of the, you know, the homeland security, which is responsible for a million things. Massive government bureaucracy. Nobody cares. Post 9-11, we started spending money like there was no tomorrow. Nobody cared. Nobody cares today. So 9-11, government grew. Government power over our lives through surveillance grew. Government power over our lives through our behavior at airports grew. And the government engaged in, you know, in what turned out to be mass sacrifice of American troops for nothing in its wars overseas. And the problem of terrorism, by the way, has not gone away. It's just in a lull. There will be the right time when it comes back. post so that's post 9-11. America changed. Americans before 9-11 wouldn't have tolerated a TSA like this. There was some consciousness about government spending. There was some care about how American troops were used. There was certainly a concern about spying. All of that is gone, and the government can basically almost do what it wants in those arenas. After 2008, again, we misdiagnosed the problem. The problem was, too, was banks, too little regulation, too little controls. And the solution was massive addi additional regulation, Dodd-Frank, massive growth in government, stimulus packages, and, and a massive increase in government spending. Again, nobody cared. And a basic, fundamental shift in Americans thinking about capitalism. Before 2008, generally capitalism was viewed as a positive and socialism was ridiculed. 2008 launched, really, the popularity of socialism and basically the death in the American minds of capitalism. The last remnant of some kind of support for capitalism was the Tea Party movement. But it was mainly old people. It was mainly, um, it, it, it didn't last, and it didn't have cultural resonance. What had cultural resonance is the anti-capitalist movement, both on the left and on the right, that I've documented on the show over and over again, both Bernie Sanders 
and Donald Trump and the national conservatism and all the variety of national conservatism that exists out there that basically reject the idea of capitalism. So 2008 really destroyed the concept of capitalism and free markets and, and cemented the idea that government must have a dramatic, significant, substantial role in our economic lives. So both crises did this. They grew the role of government significantly. And they eroded our commitment to freedom, to individualism, to capitalism, to the American way of life. I mean, I don't know anything good that came out of 9-11. I mean, other than the recognition that Islam and, and particularly Islamic totalitarianism was a threat in some parts of the culture. I don't know anything good that came out of 9-11, and I know nothing good that came out of 2008. Even though 2008 was caused by government regulation, caused by too big of a government, caused by a Federal Reserve, that didn't stick. That story has no resonance with the American people. So in both cases, it was both cases, the crisis led to bigger government and less freedom. Now, I think, unfortunately, that is going to be the case for coronavirus. Um, I saw an article, I think this is on Politico, where they interviewed 20 cultural figures about what they thought the outcome, well, how will the world change post-coronavirus? And, you know, some of it was pretty innocuous that they mentioned different things. Some of it was ludicrous, like, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be less polarized. Um, I mean, there's a sense in which we might be, but I don't think that's what he meant. Um, but I think some of it was quite perceptive and scary. So one said, post-coronavirus, we will be less individualistic. To quote, the coronavirus pandemic marks the end of our romance with market society and hyper-individualism. We could turn towards authoritarianism, the person said. Who is this? this is Eric Kleinberg, some professor of sociology at, at NYU. But he says, we're now seeing the market-based models for social organization fail catastrophically. A, a self-seeking behavior makes this crisis so much more dangerous than it needed to be. We will reorient our politics and make substantial new investments in public goods for health especially and for public services. So I think he's absolutely right for the wrong reasons. He views this as a positive. I view it as a negative. But yes, I think one of the consequences of this is a rejection, further rejection of markets for the rejection of individualism, a greater reliance on government, a greater demand for government to take over health care and for greater public services, and a recognition coming out of the stimulus plan and the lockdowns that our economy cannot function without a government writing $2 trillion checks, that the only way to survive the lockdown, which of course was necessary, they will claim, was for the government to step in and write those checks in a laissez-faire capitalist economy. If you'd had lockdowns, who is going to write the checks? Who is going to pay these people? They're all going to starve. That's going to be the story. So we need government in emergencies. And by the way, they will tell us, and, and some of the people mention this and some of these others commentaries. There are other crises that we need a government now that are just as bad as coronavirus, we will be told. For example, the obvious one is climate change. 
Climate change cannot be solved by markets, cannot be solved by individuals, cannot be solved. It, mu it can only be solved by the state. And climate change has the potential to kill many more people, we will be told, than coronavirus. And therefore, the state must intervene. And if it has to shut down whole industries, well, so what? We already shut down whole industries. We'll just write big, fat stimulus checks, and that'll solve the problem. Or, for example, there is another crisis that makes coronavirus much worse. And indeed, not just coronavirus, but actually makes climate change much worse, or the, the response to climate change much worse. It creates all of our problems much worse, and that's inequality. And there is indeed no way to deal with inequality unless the government takes it on and deals with it. So we need the government to intervene in markets, and if necessary, to write trillion-dollar checks so that we can deal with this crisis of inequality. Why won't this paste? There we go. All right, I don't know what happened there. And you can imagine, on and on and on, the, the left will come up with every crisis possible, and the right will do the same. Uh, crisis of the family, crisis of abortion, crisis of this, crisis of that. Uniform to most of these people is the belief that we need much more government intervention in healthcare. So you get demands, they expect to see public demands for much more involvement in government in healthcare, in universal healthcare, in single payer, or as one Steph Sterling of the Roosevelt Institute, that tells you everything you need to know about this guy, suggests. What we really need is to nationalize our pharmaceutical industry. Because the fact is our pharmaceutical industry cannot, has, does not have the incentives to make a virus, uh, 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 a vaccine. So we need government to make the vaccine. And by the way, that's true of many diseases. So we need government to take over the pharmaceutical company or to create its own pharmaceutical company to compete with the pharmaceutical companies. So you could see government involvement heavily involved in pharmaceutical development. By the way, how is that going in Europe or in other countries? I don't know if any countries tried it, and there's a reason they haven't tried it. Even the so-called socialist countries haven't tried it. Basically, almost all of the people on this argue that just like, they don't say this, but I will say it, just like every other crisis, the winner in this crisis is big government. Give them, big government will come out of this victorious and ever bigger. They saved us because they quarantined us, because they locked us down. Rights? You care about rights, but we violated your rights and we saved you. We saved your life. Who cares about rights? Society is better off because government acted in a decisive, assertive way. So we will venerate government even more. Look, wow, they did it. And whether you want to venerate Trump or you want to venerate Como or Newsom in California, it doesn't matter. The principle is going to be we, wow, government acted. And I think the death rate from this virus is going to be lower than the $100,000 that the government is, 100,000 people that the government is saying now. So they'll claim a success because they got in a number significantly lower. And we will say, wow, whew, we survived it. And of course, the stimulus package is going to reduce the pain. It's going to prevent a Great Depression. It will cause us to stagnate for decades. But that's unseen. We don't have a parallel universe where we act differently differently. So that'll be taken as just the status quo. We already had that after 2008. It was just the death of growth. You know, we'd reached our growth capacity. The economy couldn't grow more than it grew under Obama and under Trump. We had economists writing whole books, big books, arguing that growth was dead. We'd reached our max. So, 
what we'll see is that people didn't stop in the street. What we'll see is that fewer businesses failed. What we'll see is airlines getting a bailout and they'll be up in the sky again. And what will internalize is, yeah, government can save us. Government can manage the economy. Government can protect us from disaster. Government spending stimulates. We don't have an alternative universe where this didn't happen. We don't have an alternative universe where the, government, where the U.S. economy grows at 4% instead of zero. And to see the differences in quality and standard of living that that results in. So I see nothing positive, nothing positive coming out of this politically, economically. Maybe the only positive will be that the scientists are taking a little bit more seriously the national security priority shift and now they shift towards planning for future pandemics. But that can also lead to a lot of negatives. For example, we can increase surveillance just like we did after 9-11. We can have bio trackers implanted under our skin to determine when we have a fever, when we've been exposed to a virus. All kinds of things that technology allows governments to do today to violate our privacy. We can be harassed much more about the countries we visit, the places we go to, the people we interact with, all in the name of protecting us from the next pandemic. So having pandemics taken more seriously can be can definitely have negative implications if we're not careful. And we're not. We're showing no sign of actually being careful. So, again, I, I really see no positives. For ex another negative. If we do take the pandemic seriously, and we have more pandemic planning, will we then start restricting trade in significant ways? Will we then believe that we have to build some kind of arsenal of protective gear, some kind of supply chain that's all internal to the United States, and eliminate global supply chains, and eliminate our ability, our, our ability to trade globally, all in the name now of national security? And you can imagine that a president like Trump certainly would jump on that. Wow. Okay, my computer's behaving weird. All right, we'll manage. So I worry that the more we take corona or pandemic, future pandemics more seriously, the more we restrict freedom in the present. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. using the super chat and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time so I'll do it again maybe we'll get some more today um, if you like what you're hearing if you appreciate what I'm doing then I appreciate your support uh, those of you who don't yet support the show please take this opportunity go to yourunbrookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com yourunbrookshow and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...